family, what's up? Pastor Darius here. Just finished a message you're about to watch. It was, it was a powerful moment for our church, Change Church. The message is called Settling Season is Over. I started a new series called Christian Ish. It's time to take your life to the next level. Enjoy this message. God bless you. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Here's the topic to this lesson on today. Settling season is over. Somebody needs to put a praise on that prophetically. I'm going to say it again. Settling season is over. If you receive that already, give God the best praise you can. This settling season is it's over. It's over. In John 10.10, 10, we get to eavesdrop on a conversation that Jesus is having with his mentees, his apprentices. We call them disciples. It is a conversation that I hope will create some expectation in you and I. Because in this conversation, there's some communication about the quintessential contribution that he wants to make to the lives of all of those who follow his leadership as a good shepherd. He communicates the contribution he wants to make to our life by contrasting himself with someone else he calls the thief. Our enemy, the evil one. He says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Now I want you to see Jesus' intentionality in using three different words to describe the activity that the adversary wants to engage in. Sometimes he doesn't want to destroy. Sometimes he wants to steal. Did you hear what I just said? Sometimes he's not trying to steal. Sometimes he's trying to kill. Not physically necessarily, but emotionally, relationally, spiritually, mentally, professionally. Is there anybody here that will honestly audit your life and admit, I see some areas where the enemy has been attempting to steal some things, to kill some things, and to destroy some things. But is there anybody also resting in this room watching on our online campus that's got a righteous resilience and a spiritual stubbornness and that will tell the devil every time you take something, I'm going to take it back. Let me go to this side. Did you hear what I just said? Does anybody, what's up fam? Does anybody have a, re, a internal resurrecting resilience on the inside of you that says to the enemy, anytime you put something to death in my life, give me three days. I let you take my joy for a season, but it's getting back up again. And I let you kill my peace for a season, but it's getting back up again. And there are some things in your life that the enemy may have destroyed. But is there anybody here that's got a Humpty Dumpty anointing? Come on, come on. Yeah, you had a great fall and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. But Jesus took the broken pieces of your life and put it back together again. He says, that's what the thief comes to do. So he's describing, he's describing his contribution by contrasting what the thief wants to do so that you never confuse him with the thief. Did you hear what I just said? So if something's being stolen, that's the thief, not God. If something's being killed, that's the thief not God. If something's being destroyed, that's the thief. <sighs> Some of us are blaming God 
for the activity assigned to the thief. The thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. But listen to what Jesus says. I came. See, I love the ESV here. Because it makes it clear Jesus talking past tense. I, I came. I already came. I came. Not I'm coming. Not I'm on the way. I came. I came that you may have life. We can't miss this. He clearly communicates. This is the quintessential contribution I want to make to your life. I want to give you life. I'm going to say that one more time. He's saying, out of all the things that I give you, the various ways I add value to your life above everything else, what is preeminent and primary is I came to give you life. I came to give you what you can't get anywhere else. I, I'm getting ahead of myself here. He says, so if you have not embraced, received, walking in the life that I've given you, you are better, but you're not at your best. Well, Pastor Darius, I got morals. Good, but I came to give you more than that. Come on here. He, 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 he says, I came to give you life. Come on, and not only that, not only that, he says, and I want you to have it abundantly. Not barely. Not sort of. Not kind of. Not a little bit of. He said, this life I want to give you, I want to give it to you in abundance. I want to give you more than you can handle. I want to fill your cup until your cup is running over. I want you oozing with this life. I want you breathing this life. I want you expressing this life. This is what's interesting though. Jesus makes this statement about life to people who are already alive. So in their mind, they've got to be thinking, what do you mean you came to give me life? I'm alive already. <laughs> See, what Jesus is offering to them is a kind of life that is different in quality than the life they currently possess. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He, 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 is, he is offering to them a quality of life that failed to exist prior to him showing up. What they have now is bios. What Jesus wants to give here, this word life, is zoe. It's like he's saying, you have bios, but I want to give you zoe. Zoe is the God kind of life. It is a life that is superior in quality than the life you have without God. It is a life characterized by a spiritual satisfaction that quenches your inner thirst so that you are no longer ruled and governed by unsatisfied urges and desires. It's a life where we possess peace that passes all understanding. It's a life where we have joy that flows from the inside that isn't predicated on what's happening on the outside. It's a life where we have wisdom that functions like a wall and protects us from unnecessary adversity because of unwise decisions. It's a life where we have the stamina to stand in the midst of tests and trials and tribulations. It's a life where you got a palm tree makeup where you bend but you don't break Jesus said I came to give you that and you just settling for a vacation I'm, I, well, I, 
Let me go to this side. Where's my, let me preach to the camera. Who, who, who am I preaching to? He said, I came to give you all of that and you settling. But I believe God wants to use this series to create divine agitation and God-ordained holy discontent. I, I believe frustration is God's friend. And he'll use frustration uh, to create agitation to get you out of something that you settled in because it's better than what you had, but it's not as good as where you're going. To. I came today to make somebody agitated. I hope I get on your nerves this week and next week because I came to tell you as good as it is, it can get better. And as far as you come, God's not through with you yet. I came to tell you if there's still breath in your body, there's a reason you're still here and the best is not behind you, the best is in front of you. Jesus said, I came to give you that kind of life. That's what, I, that's what I came to give. And Jesus said, I don't want to just give it regularly. I want to give it abundantly. Are y'all okay? See, I'm, I want you to see now not just the difference between what Jesus said he gives and the thief gives, I want you to see the difference between what Jesus says he gives and what church has conditioned you to accept. Y'all aren't, are you ready for me? You getting it this week and next week and the week after that. I want you to contrast the difference between what he says he came to give you and what you've been conditioned to accept. And I don't know what you've been conditioned to accept. I don't know everyone's religious experience, but I'm speaking generally. And what I'm saying generally is that depending on what, if you come up in a faith tradition, depending on what faith tradition you came up in, there was a bend in that tradition that probably prioritized something that was not that high on Jesus's list of priorities. Y'all not talking to me. Some of you come from traditions where deliverance was what was prioritized. So there was an obsession with coming out. Not realizing the purpose of coming out is to go in. Let me go to this side. So you get delivered from cultural bondage and then get re-entangled with religious bondage. All you did was change masters. So I don't go to the club anymore, but you're jealous and you're gossip and you're competitive and you're mean and you're still thirsty, a little bit petty, a little bit ratchet, but our places I used to go I'm saved. No love in your heart. No grace for other people. Religious elitism. Not giving other people grace to be at a different level on their spiritual journey than you are. That kind of religious expression is what Jesus calls the letter of the law. And Paul said, the letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. I want life. Where's the life? So this series 
is for people that want that life. Yeah, I want to be delivered, but I want that life. Yeah, I want to be filled, but I want that life. Yeah, I want to operate with gifts in the spirit, but I want, the, I want that life. I want what he was talking about. Because all this stuff y'all giving me, I tried it. This, this ain't it. Let me find a real. Somebody put some fire in that chat. I said, this right here, this playing church, this, this, this ain't it. I'm tired. I want to know, am I talking to anybody that's just tired? Let me find. I said, am I talking to anybody that's just tired? I'm tired of singing about stuff I'm not living. I'm tired of reading about exceedingly, abundantly, above all. You ask a thing, and I'm not experiencing that. I want life. I'm just reading Jesus' words. He said, that's what I came to give. He said, y'all fighting over stuff that ain't even a priority for me. Who besides me, you say, I want life. I want that, Pastor. I want life. I want, wave at me in the chat. Use the wave emoji. I want, I want life. Here it is. I got a quote. Y'all know I love sweets. As I was in preparation for this presentation, I came across a quote that I think will, will, will help us. Here's the quote. It's a quote about life. This is what the writer says. He says, life is like a cake. If it's baked with the right ingredients, it tastes like heaven in every bite you take. I'm going to read it one more time. The writer says, life is like a cake. If it's baked with the right ingredients, it tastes like heaven. Every bite you take. But it doesn't taste like heaven unless it's baked with... <laughs> it doesn't... It doesn't taste like heaven unless it's, uh, unless it's, unless it's baked uh, with, with the right ingredients. Life is like a cake. And, and it, it... Okay, so I need... I, I, got, I got some ingredients here. This is a little, little cake mix. That's all that is. Little, little cake mix, huh? Little cake mix. Little, number a little egg here. Number a little egg. That's, that's all that is. See, if I had time, I'd preach Romans 8 because all of this stuff independently is nasty. But when you stir it up, it all works together and become good. I want... <laughs> little, just a little... It's a little... Little, little, little butter, little butter. That's 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 all. Here, just just need just need the right ingredients. I need some milk. That's some milk right there. That's that's some milk, right? That's so. Uh, how, how many so far? You would agree that if I'm baking a cake, the cake mix, butter, eggs, milk, right ingredients, right? That, that, that that's probably it. Okay. I got, I got on this side though, I got a little rice. Put a little rice in there. I, I, I want to I add that to my cake. Got, got, I got some black beans here. I'm put some black beans. You don't put black beans in your, in your cake? Black beans in your cake? Some black beans in your cake. You know? And I, I, this, this ain't number a little. Little dirt made out of dirt. Dirt don't hurt. Put it in your mouth. Let it work. Just a little, little, little dirt right here. Y'all don't. Y'all heard a dirt cake, right? No, little, little dirt cake right here. So I just wanna stir it all up together. Yeah, I wanna stir all this, this up together. Cause this is, this is. Oh yeah, that look good right there. That look good. That look good. That look good. Okay, who, who wants some? Who wants some of this? You? Why don't, why, why don't, so, what, now, now, let, let me ask you something. If, if I, let me ask you something. If, if I, if I now put this in the oven, let it bake, 
and come out. Uh, <laughs> there is some cake mix in here, right? Right? But I put stuff in here that wasn't in the written instruction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, yeah, the cake box has written instruction. The creator of the cake, <laughs> the creator of the cake mix wrote down instruction on what goes in the cake. If I add or take away from what the creator said needs to be in there, what I have is not a cake, it's cake-ish. Did you hear what I just said? I said what I have is not a cake, it's cake-ish. So watch this, I cannot get the right outcome if I don't have the right ingredients. And the, and the writer said in the quote that life is like a cake. And sometimes I don't have the right outcome because I'm not using the right ingredients. I'm looking at what my creator said, not in a box, but in a Bible. And I'm saying, I'm going to put a little bit of that, but there's also a little bit of other stuff that I like, I'm going to add to the mix of my life, but then be confused when it turned out like something I don't like. Your relationships have a recipe. Your... <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, come on, talk to me. Talk to me. I say, there's a recipe for relationships. There's a recipe for growth. There's a recipe for advancement. And what ends up happening is people add ingredients and get mad that it's not turning out the way it's supposed to turn out. It's not supposed to be sweet. So you know, you know that is, that's not cake-ish, that's Christian-ish. It's, I got a little bit of God's recipe, but I mixed it with stuff that don't belong in there. Come on, talk to me. I've got a little bit. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I've, got, I've got a little bit of the recipe, but I've, 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 I've mixed in some stuff, and I'm calling it a cake, but it's cake-ish. And I'm calling it Christian, but it's Christian-ish. It's a version of the faith that's been mixed with stuff that don't belong in there. So, I can't see something. You telling me something? Okay, we're good. All right. So, so here it is. <laughs> Y'all know I don't be good with signs. I just be confused. I'm like, what's wrong? Is something wrong? All right. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> here, here, here it is, guys. Here it is. Pastor Darius, what are some traits of Christian-ish? I, I just want to give you a few. And then I got 10 minutes, 23 seconds. 20 seconds. Y'all all right? Okay. I just, I just want to give you a few. Here it is. Here's some traits of Christian-ish. It sees God's instructions as suggestions. I ain't got to put no egg in there. It's all right without egg. I know people that make penny cakes that don't use eggs, so I'm not putting egg in my cake. I don't need cake mix. It sees God's instructions as suggestions. It, it sees the Bible as a rule book and not a recipe. It's not a rule book. God's not trying to give us more rules to follow. This is a relationship with God, right? But he's giving us a recipe. This is the recipe. So what happens is Christian-ish does this. It sees this as an asset, but it's not authoritative. 
So it's like, I can use it when I want to and how I want to, but when parts of this conflict with, well, I don't want to change. <laughs> it's, it's like leaving ingredients out. Okay, y'all ready? Here's another one. It sees Jesus as Savior, but not Lord. What does that mean? It means, Jesus, I accept everything from you but your leadership. Fix my life, but don't tell me what to do with it. Don't tell me I got to forgive people. <laughs> don't tell me I got to pray for my enemies. Okay, I'm, I'm <laughs> can I, are we all right? <laughs> I feel like the air went out of the room. We okay? Here, here it is, guys. I want you to catch this. <laughs> Dallas Willard, we've talked about this, the USC, uh, former, the late Dallas Willard, theologian and professor of philosophy at USC, calls this vampire Christianity. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's a vampire? He said, this is a Christianity where people want Jesus' blood, but that's it. <laughs> so all I want is your blood just give me the blood to cover me forgive me. But, but, but don't don't tell me to see now watch this now some of, some of you are like Pastor Darius alright well what's the difference between being Christian-ish and just being an imperfect person who's Christian there's a difference One tries to change the recipe. The other recognizes, I just need some grace to keep it. Let me, let me, I got to go to the next location. Y'all, I said, I said, one tries to change the recipe. But the, the, see, that's Christian is. But the, just the imperfect person like you and me, who's a Christian, we say, I see that there, but Lord, you're going to have to help me forgive that one. I, I'm not going to change your word, but that one right there, I need the Holy Ghost. I need the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost to help me with that one. I know you told me pray for my enemies, and I know I need to, but I need you to help me because it's hard for your boy to do it today. Come on. We don't try to change the recipe. We just say, Lord, I need some grace. <laughs> Is there anybody here say, I need, I just need some grace. I'm not, I'm not trying to change the recipe. I just need some, need some grace. See, all, <laughs> all throughout biblical history, there's been this tension between God's intention for the way our faith would work versus historical, institutionalized approaches to the way our faith should work. There's been the, Jesus dealt with in Matthew 21, verse 12. It says he entered the temple courts drove out all those that were, that were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he said, it's written, my house will be a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. He said, now, it's written in the recipe that it's supposed to be one thing. You are making it into something that's inconsistent with the recipe and you like it and you think because you do I do but see I want you to catch I want you to catch because most people well, well not most but many times we stop teaching this passage at the point where Jesus drives the exploiters out and I'm not even going to bother this because some because some people just so, I don't know, they're just so. 
I'd be having to help get so, so many Christian business people free. God's anti-exploitation. God's not anti-profit. Okay, that's a whole nother. These people were exploiting, they were conniving, they were manipulating. The point is, he drives them out, right? Jesus drives them out, and most people stop there. But the text tells you what happens when stuff lines up with his original intent. Text says, verse 14 says, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. Come on. Come on. So, which if they were blind, they were living life, but they couldn't see. They were at a deficit. If they were lame, they were living life, but they couldn't move. They were alive, but they were not experiencing life as God intended. When the church aligned with God's original intent, then people started getting results. Gosh. They started getting results that they couldn't get because you only get the right result when you do it according to the recipe. We don't follow the recipe. Pastor Darius, I want to be spiritual strong. Did you get a pathway to purpose to learn how to do spiritual disciplines? No. Well, how are you going to be strong? That's the recipe. You can't get close to nobody you don't talk to. This is not magic. This is not magic. Pastor Darius, I want to I wanna grow. Consistency. I don't know if I can be consistent. Well, you don't want to grow bad enough yet. And that don't mean you're a bad person. And it doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean you should be judged. It just means that when you're ready to grow, you'll be consistent. It means I can't go to the gym one day, then come back, look in the mirror, expect to see a difference. Y'all aren't talking to me. It means I can't pray one day, don't do it anymore, and expect to be spiritually sensitive. Is this all right, guys? I, I hope you feel like I'm a trainer and I'm not condemning you. Do you feel that way? You feel like I I'm trying to tell you one more rep. You got one more in you. Right? I want you to feel challenged. And what I'm saying is, guys, some of us are baking cakes with recipes that have been given to us by people we love and trust. Come on now, talk to me. Everybody make their dressing a little different, right? There's, there's little added things. And so when it comes to the way we live our life, we've been handed recipes. And sometimes we're just following that recipe that was given to us. But it's not a recipe that comes from the creator. So it doesn't give us the results. All right, Tario, let's get ready to wrap up. They tired. They tired of me. Y'all know I, I just got back, so. <laughs> ah. And I miss y'all. And, and I'll be here next week, too. All right. So, um, I came today to tell you settling season is over. Do we want to be delivered? Yes. But I came to tell you, stop settling for just being delivered. Do you want to be a better person? Yes, we all want to be better. But just stop settling for just being. Jesus, I want to give you life. And I'm telling you, in every space, whether it's business space, whether it's church space, I see such a, a gap between what Jesus want to give us and what we've been taught to accept. Are y'all, I hope I'm not, are y'all okay? Yeah. We have sanctified settling and called it humility. Oh, 
like, I don't, I don't want, I don't want nothing else. I'm just. You can be appreciative and grateful for what you have and still walk in anticipation and expectation of what God's going to do. We're not wanting anything God doesn't want for us. I want what you say you want to give me. That's it. I'm just in passionate pursuit of what you died to give me. You died to give me this. You didn't die just so I could break a habit. You didn't shed your blood just for me to break a habit. Life that's eternal in quality and quantity. And there are a few areas where I feel like we're going to explore over the course of, of this month where there's some where we're Christianists, but I want you to know foundationally today, we cannot have this life without properly understanding the meaning of life. Because it's the first area the enemy tries to confuse us. We're Christianists when it comes to the meaning of life. I cannot have the God kind of life without properly understanding the meaning of life. Why are you here? What are you supposed to be doing with your life? You will not have joy unspeakable full of glory if you have and I have a version or an understanding of the meaning of life that's not aligned with the creator. I want you to catch this. My wife and I went on vacation and I was working out in the gym and this doesn't always happen to me. But I'm working out, and Alex, I had an epiphany. I'm talking about, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to get back to my workout. And I went back to the room, and I went out on the balcony, and I started typing this part of the sermon, and I wept. I repented, and I wept. I didn't repent of sin. I repented of a misunderstanding. I want you to catch this. What is the meaning of life? If you asked me before, I would have been like, you know, purpose, right? That's the reason for the creation of this type of thing. But Isaiah chapter 43, verse 6 and 7 says, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. The meaning of life is not the pursuit of happiness. The meaning of life is the glory of God. God said, you were born, Haba, to glorify me. I created you for my glory. And your obsession should not be your agenda. Your obsession should be my glory. How do I look through your life? And it is almost like there's this version of Christianity where it is our agenda that's primary and God's job is to bless us. So it's like God's job is to help us get glory. Think about it. When I'm just at, do my thing, bless my thing. God's job is not to glorify me. My job is to glorify him. He created me for this. Pastor Darius, when you say, when I say God's glory, it just means God expressed. It means the image bearer of God. It means that others see traits in us, in their observations of us, and their interactions with us that enable them to experience God through us. How about 
I don't care if you sweep the floor, you were created for his glory. I don't care where you work, you were created for his glory. I don't care how old you are, he wants people to see his traits through their observations and their interactions with you. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, Darius, we're not pursuing glory, you're, you're pursuing happiness. God's not saying, I don't want you happy. He's saying, but pursuing happiness ain't the way to it. Jesus. He says, seek, seek first. Put as a priority the kingdom of God. Are y'all ready for this revelation? He says, put as a priority the kingdom of God. Put that as your, don't put your agenda as a priority and then ask me to bless that. I want you to put as a priority the kingdom of God and all of these things including happiness is added. You can never catch happiness. It's uncatchable and if you catch it, it's unkeepable. You'll only have it for a season and you'll lose it. But God said, if you will chase me, I'll add it unto you. He says, I'll add it. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. He says, Darius, the unwillingness to put me first is an indication that my people don't know who they are. It's not that they don't know who I am. They don't know who they are. And the reason is, because Jesus says in Matthew 6, all these things the Gentiles seek after. Y'all missed it. He's saying, People that are not my people have to chase it. They got to chase the happiness. They got to chase the things. But people that are my people don't have to chase it. They chase me and then I take responsibility to add unto them. And there were some things in my heart I was having a hard time doing and some things in my heart I was having a hard time letting go. And the Holy Spirit broke me and said, do it for my glory. How about that? Don't do it because they deserve it. Do it for my glory. Don't do it because you want to. Do it for my glory. Don't do it because other people will applaud you. Do it for my glory. I don't know who this is for, but I'm telling you, do it for his glory. Do it for his glory. And I can't be glorified the way I want to be glorified in your settling. God say there, there another way. And I'm, I'm done. I know this is not, this is not a fire night. I was having a conversation with Joe and my wife last night. We're trying to figure out how to create a space where we can bring some of this back, where we got ministry time. And I'm not like a super be in the heavens kind of guy. I try to cultivate my relationship with God. I study the best of my ability. I've been trained. I just try to teach you the word of God and let the Holy Spirit do the work. But I, but I, I saw how this service went in. I saw it. He showed me. And that doesn't happen all the time with me, but I saw this one. I saw what God did in my heart on that balcony. He was going to be doing it in the hearts of people all over this room and all online. Say, do it from my glory. God said, I want to be glorified in your person. That's who you are. He's, she said, just in your character. Not in your perfection. Just in your character, your love for people, your patience, your empathy. 
He said, I want people to experience me through your character, your attitude. He wants to be glorified through our productivity. God says, I don't give you potential to waste. You don't have the right to say this good, good enough for you. I didn't give this to you for you. This is not about you. I run into that all the time with people, when we talk about economic empowerment and, and wealth accumulation and economic freedom and stuff like that. Well, I got all I need. Well, what about the children that don't have shoes to go back to school? What about the single mothers that you screamed at to have the baby? Now let's help them raise it. So you're like, I got all I need. He's just thinking about you. So many other people don't. He says, I want, I want to be glorified in your, in your partnerships and the way you handle people. The way you handle the waitress. Say, so you my servant. That's not your servant. Come on, we playing no games. No, how do you handle that waitress? Come on, Christian, how do you handle that waitress? Does she feel better about her value in the eyes of God after her encounter with you and me or worse? Had a tendency to be in my phone a lot of stuff. My mind is always going. I'm always typing notes, always working. But I, I've been trying to make a point of this, even at restaurants, put my phone down and look, look, look them in the eye. I'm looking down while you're talking to me and then telling God bless you and God loves you. But I'm not even giving you my attention. He said, I want to be glorified in your provision and what you do with your resources. I want people to see me in that. Not just in the amount of TVs that we accumulate. Most of us have to choose what to wear because we got so many options. Our kids in their orphanage in Haiti, they don't have that option. They're not confused about what they got to wear. They don't have options. And God's like, oh, yeah, so you think I don't care about that? <laughs> you think I want to be glorified by that? I saw it. And I sat on that balcony. And I said, Lord, I repent. I want to live for your glory. I want you to be glorified through me. My time is up. I got to go. But I want to give you a moment in the privacy of your own heart to let God do what he needs to do to you and let God say what he needs to say to you and you say what you need to say to him. Just a moment and I'm going to dismiss us. But I saw this. Yes. Raise it, Joe.
So, Father, we want to live our lives not perfectly. We know that's unattainable, unachievable. We know that you don't even expect that from us. But, Lord, we, we make a U-turn. We repent. We change our direction. And we live our life now, not in pursuit of our agenda, but in pursuit of your glory. And we thank you as we put that as a priority. All of the things we are pursuing, we will not go without. You will add them to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. We say to our soul, settling season is over. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the glory of the former, and the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want to thank you for watching and I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our streams and any of our videos. All right. If this message bless you, do me a favor, share it with somebody else. I'll see you next time.